uh, is uh, there's two questions here on purgatory. How do I explain the difference between what we believe about salvation versus the belief of purgatory? And the other was, what are the pastor's beliefs about purgatory? So this is something I would never in a million years have picked as a topic to preach on for myself, but as we've got two different people have asked about it, sounds like we should probably uh, take, a, take a poke at this and, and see what we come up with. So, uh, in their classic song, Wish You Were Here, uh, Roger Waters of Pink Floyd sings, So You Think You Can Tell Heaven From Hell. And I'm like, yes, I do. I think I can tell the difference between those. Uh, and as I jump into talking about heaven and hell and purgatory, I, uh, I'm going to start out with some, just some basic scriptures and kind of cover what heaven is, what hell is, and then where purgatory fits. Does, is it real? Um, is it not real? If it is real, what, what does it do? Uh, I'll, I'll just get into all of that stuff. And uh, hopefully, you will come out feeling like you've learned something today. Um, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And bang, there was light. I added the bang. <laughs> and God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness and called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and morning the first day. And so it's interesting here. God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. So there are heavens. And uh, how many heavens are there? I, you know, you've heard of somebody sing about seventh heaven, and I don't find it in the Bible. Uh, but my understanding is there are three level, levels of heaven. Two are the sky, like around the earth. That's the first heaven. And then the second heaven is the sun, moon, and stars, and all of outer space is a, is a heaven. Okay, the heavens declare your glory. And then the third heaven where Paul talks about, I know a man who was caught up to the third heaven and saw amazing mysteries and is not permitted to talk about those. And you go, yeah, you know a guy, huh, Paul? So, like, I want to ask you a question about for a friend of mine. I... <laughs> but what if my friend, so, yeah, as far as we know, that was, he's talking about himself. He was caught up third heaven and wasn't allowed to talk about it because he saw amazing, mind-blowing uh, things that he, he couldn't even describe with the human mouth. So, there are, th <laughs> there are three levels of heavens that are talked about in the Bible. Um, two of which, one we live in right here in the atmosphere, one we can see with telescopes, the Hubble and the Webb are amazing. If you must see some cool stuff, uh, talk to Richard Ignis, look him up on Facebook. If you're not a friend of his, tell him you know me and want to see his NASA pictures. Uh, he is a professor of astrophysics at East Tennessee University and a, a cornerstone boy from long ago. <laughs> so and one of the probably nicest people you'll ever meet anywhere on the face of the planet. So opposite of heaven, uh, which we can tell the difference, even if Roger Waters doesn't think he should be able to or, or really can, uh, is hell. And I'm going to look at Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, all nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the peoples one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will pull the sheep on his right, put the sheep on his right, and the goats on his left, and the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes, clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. And he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That would be hell in case you're not keeping up. Um, for I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat, thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I need clo needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you, hungry, thirsty, or stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And so I got all of that in there because I think it lays out pretty clear dichotomy. It's this or it's this. It's sheep or it's goats. It's heaven or it's hell. There is a teaching, and here we go. I have never read from the Catholic catechism before. I have never, and I will share out of 2 Maccabees as well, which I have never done. But we're doing new things this morning. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines purgatory as purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Okay, I agree. Hebrews says without holiness, it's impossible to see the Lord. Right, so, okay, but it's this achievement part which we're going to have trouble with. Which is, okay, so, achieve the joy, the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven, which is experienced by those who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified. This is from CCC, which I believe is Catholic, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1030, if you need to look this up because I know we have scholars here who need that. And it notes that this final purification of the elect is entirely different from the punishment of the damned, and this is CCC 1031. Purification is necessary because the scripture teaches nothing unclean will enter the presence of God in heaven, Revelation 2127, and while we may die with our mortal sins forgiven, there can still be impurities in us, specifically venial sins and temporal punishment due to sins already forgiven. Okay. That is straight out of the Catholic texts about purgatory. You're nodding at me. You've heard this before. You have. You grew up Catholic. I actually looked up the catechism of my dad. <laughs> Did you really? Because So did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So here's some justifications which are given from Catholic sources about purgatory. Luke chapter, and a couple from Luke chapter 12. And it says, when we die, we undergo what is call, uh, called the particular, I believe this is from, yeah, um, yeah, it's still from Catholic Church. I've got some Augustine quotes later. So uh, when we die, we undergo what's called the the particular or individual judgment. Scripture said, says it is appointed for men once to die, and after that comes judgment. We are judged instantly and receive our reward for good or ill. We know at once what our final destiny will be. At the end of time, when Jesus returns, there will become the general judgment, which the Bible refers to, for example, in Matthew 25, 31 to 32, which I just read to you guys the sheep and the goats. Before him will be gathered all nations, and he will separate them from one another as shepherds separate sheep from goats. In this general judgment, all our sins will be publicly revealed. Yay. Augustine said in the city of God that temporary punishments are suffered by some in this life only, by others after death, and by others both now and then, but all of them before the last and strictest judgment. It is between the particular 
and the general judgments then, that a soul is purified of remaining consequences of sin, I tell you, and this is Luke 12, 59, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the very last copper or penny. Um, and so that is one of the, that, that's the only, that, that's the scriptural justification for the doctrine of purgatory. Uh, well, okay, so let's look at those verses, shall we? Uh, they, he says, Luke 12, 2 through 5, well, that was the first one. So I'm going to read you Luke 12, 1 through 7, so you get, get a little context. Meanwhile, when a crowd of thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you've whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom to fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not, uh, don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Uh, so Jesus is talking about hypocrisy in context from verse 1 and saying there's nothing, that is, nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Maybe everything you ever did will be shown up on the altar screen at Jesus' judgment time. I don't know that that scripture is really teaching that. I think, it's, I think as I read it, that what's being taught is if you are acting in hypocrisy, uh, you're not, it's going to get exposed. If you're preaching holiness and you have a few girls on the side that you keep in various houses, that's going to come out. Uh, <laughs> and unfortunately, we've been seeing that uh, come out. Um, I don't know that that's talking about all of everything you've ever done is going to be is going to be broadcast. But even if it is, even if that's true, is that is this is this talking about the time between your death and Jesus' ultimate return and the judgment at the at the uh, the judgment seat of Christ, where He separates the sheep from the ghost? I don't know how you draw that out of there. Um, maybe somebody smarter than me can figure it out, but I, I don't see it. But um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that being like an interjudgment period where you go through this judgment and that judgment, and then you still got sins to pay for, and I'll get, get to that part a little later. Uh, Luke 12, 57, uh, the other piece that they said, why don't you judge for yourself what is right? As you are going with your adversary to a magistrate, try hard to be reconciled on the way, or your adversary may drag you off to the judge. The judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you paid the last penny. Uh, this is just a parable Jesus is, is giving, uh, some, some wisdom, uh, at a time when they had debtor's prison. So... To say that that applies to purgatory, I don't, I don't see how that applies to anything other than, you know, if you're going to court, um, try to get it resolved. Try to settle things without winding up in debtor's prison. I, I just don't see it being spiritualizable to something else. So, third, third thing. Well, here we go. Second Maccabees. <laughs> uh, the verse they want me to read you is verse 46, and that will be the, the one I finish with. Uh, why are we including Second Maccabees? Because, I don't know, this is what the Catholics use. That's why I'm referencing it. But it's interesting that uh, 
Second Maccabees and First Maccabees are talking about the time of the, the Maccabean Rebellion. Amazingly, that's why the book's named that. And that's not part of the Jewish Old Testament. That's not part of the Jewish canon at all. So why is it part of the canon for some other groups? I don't, I don't know. These are too hard for me. Um, no, there, there's reasons, and you, but not in the scope of what do we believe about purgatory. But, but man, it's, it's, hard, it's a hard thing for me to buy that it wasn't part of the Jewish canon. It wasn't part of the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, which was what was used by the Jews at the time and therefore by the infant church as the scriptures, but now we're going to kind of reach back through our amazing historical process several hundred years, and we're going to pull it into the canon for the Catholic Church, but we're still going to actually call it part of the, uh, um, I want to say Apocrypha, but they actually have a different name, Deuter, Deuter something canonical. I don't, I don't know. It's a long word that's hard to pronounce. But basically, it's all the stuff the Jews missed in the Old Testament, and then the stuff in the New Testament, if we're splitting hairs, are technically called the Apocrypha, which would be like the Shepherd of Hermes and the, the Gospel of, or the letter Barnabas, or just a bunch of them that, that, again, if we really want to get into this, there are whole seminary classes on why and why not for all these books. I'm not touching that one. I'm going to reference it, but I'm not going to go any further into it. Anyway, 2 Maccabees, chapter 12, verse 39. And the day following, Judas came with his company. Now, this is not Judas Iscariot. This is 150 years or so before that. To take away the bodies of them that had been slain and bury them with their kinsmen in the sepulchers of their fathers. And they found under the coats of the slain some of the donaries of the idols of Jaminia. Jamnia, Jamnia, which the law forbiddeth to the Jews, so that all plainly saw, for this was the cause, for this cause they were slain, and they all blessed the just judgment of the Lord who had discovered the things that were hidden. So breaking, betaking themselves to prayers, they besought him that the sin which had been committed might be forgotten. But the most valiant Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves from sin, for as much as they saw before their eyes what had happened because of the sins of those who were slain. And making a gathering, he sent 12,000 drachmas of drachms of silver to Jerusalem for sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the dead, thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection. For he, if he had not hoped, this is in parentheses, for if he had not hoped that they, that they that were slain should rise again, it would, be seen, it would have seemed superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. Well, yeah. And because he considered that they who had fallen asleep with godliness had great grace laid upon them, it is therefore holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins. Okay. Um, without regard to whether this belongs in the canon, that makes no sense. These guys were caught with idols. And according to the par first paragraph, they were struck dead because of the idols. And in the second paragraph, they're saying, well, they were in a state of grace. I'm sorry, you can't have it both ways. God doesn't kill you because you're in a state of grace. That doesn't make any sense. Can you imagine? Let's go back to the Old, the Old Testament, to the closest thing I can think of, which would be Achan taking stuff from Jericho. Right? What happens? Well, they lose the next battle. Everything goes bad. Dogs and cats living together. It's just, it's horrible. And then Israel loses their next battle, and they're like, what's up, God? You, you said we would win, and God comes back, and he goes, there's sin in your camp. You haven't obeyed the, the word of the Lord. And they go through this whole lottery process, and, and they zoom down, and they find this one guy who has taking some stuff that he shouldn't because he thought he would like the silver. And people died because of that, right? 
Do we see anywhere in that story? Well, what happens? And then they come out where they stone him, to him and his whole family to death. I think that's before the earth opens. That one's a little later for, for Cor. That, that's really cool. But they delete him. They, they, or what's the current generation? They unalive him with rocks. <laughs> right? Because God tells them to. And then the camp is clean. They go on. They, they start kicking butt and taking names again. And everybody kind of goes, yeah, I think God might be serious when he says, do this or don't do that. We probably should really actually do what he says or not do what he told us not to do, right? There's nothing in that story that says, but Achan died in a state of grace. Because obviously, you know, he'd come through the Jordan River. He'd been part of the Battle of Jericho. He'd been part of that army that saw the, the walls come down and didn't lose a single person in the battle. Did he die in a state of grace? Did, I, I don't think so. I think you're really reaching for straws, trying to take this, a story like that and say, well... Yeah, the Lord exposed these idols that these guys had taken, and he'd struck them. That's why they were struck down. And now we're just going to go, Lord, can you just forgive them? That would be awesome. Here's some money. But this is, this is the passage out of the Apocrypha, and I'm going to use it generically like most of, the, most of us do, the, the extra books in the Catholic Bible. But this is, this is how they're saying Purgatory exists. Um, no, I don't see it. Not at all. Uh, I, I think this is confused. In fact, I think this is one of the reasons that 2 Maccabees isn't in the canon, because it seems to just be contradictory on its face here. Um, but I, like I said, I'm, I, that's not my, my area of expertise. So... Since we're talking about weird things, <laughs> let's look at 2 Kings 13.21. We got that one on, the, on your list there, Greg? Pop that up. Yeah. Once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders, so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. And when the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life, and stood up on his feet. Now, that's pretty cool, but that's also a major head-scratcher as to what it means, or why that would happen. So, uh, anybody else read that and went, wow, I wonder what that's all about? Yeah. Just me? Okay, so, the, yeah. So, how many of you have heard about a practice called grave-soaking? or grave sucking, or any of this. Um, that's the verse that they point to, and they go, wow, man, when somebody who's really close to God dies, there's a residual anointing that stays there, and we can go and get it. Because this, because this one time. Please don't ever do that. Ever? It, it seems like necromancy to me. It seems like you're using like witchcraft with the dead. Please don't, don't even. Don't even. Okay, God did something cool once. Wow. L just let it be something cool that God did and don't try to build a whole doctrine and practice off of it. Another one, so like when Jacob is tending his father-in-law's flocks, and the father-in-law says to him, okay, your wages will be the striped ones and spotted ones. And, and he takes some branches and he cuts stripes in them and puts it in the water troughs. And he's doing magic. He's doing sympathetic magic. Don't do that. And don't look at the Bible and go, well, Jacob did it. Y yeah, Jacob did a lot of dumb things. <laughs> he married a pair of sisters. That's a dumb thing to do. Don't do that. In fact, you get later in the law, and it's explicitly said, you don't get to do that. Yeah. Uh, but, so just this is, this is definitely on the side kind of a tangent, but 
don't take the Bible and parse little pieces that are like, wow, that's so wild and cool in its little piece. Let me build a whole doctrine off of this or a whole weird teaching. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, there's a, a church in California, Bethel, and people are blaming Bethel for this doctrine. And I have, I have heard the leadership talk about it, and, and they're like, absolutely not. Don't do that. <laughs> but some people who once attended some class at Bethel have done this. And so because Aunt Sally knew somebody once who went to Bethel, and now Aunt Sally's a little nuts, we blame Bethel. Also, please don't do that. <laughs> that makes no sense. All right, so let me get back on to the whole doctrine of purgatory. So, um, so what purgatory is taught to be is a temporary refining judgment place so that if you've still got some residual penance to do, if you've still got some residual, you know, not mortal sins, what they call venial sins, because um, there is a sin that doesn't lead to death, so we're going to take that and make a whole doctrine out of that. Uh, not a willful sin or something, I don't know. I honestly don't know if there's a willful venial sin, because I think that would make it something that's way worse than an accidental sin. Anyway, if you got any residuals that need to get taken care of, that's what purgatory is for. Purgatory is not hell. Purgatory is not heaven. Purgatory is a refiner's fire to get the last of the dross out of your life before you can go to heaven. The ultimate destination in, in the Catholic theology for someone in purgatory is heaven. It's not more purgatory. But that, the little fact of saying, well, it's from this judgment to that judgment, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. So if Jesus is coming back tomorrow, Anybody that died today and went to purgatory better, better be really fast at their refining process. But if Jesus isn't coming back for 10,000 years, then, you know, it could take a long time. So it's a little fuzzy on how long somebody's supposed to be in purgatory. And you were raised Catholic, so I'll pick on you, okay? Let's say that your, grand, your grandmother's still alive. You didn't even ask which one. So they're both, all your grandparents are, are passed away. And, and you, yeah. you, you follow this, this doctrine, hypothetically, and you hear that grandma is in purgatory and she's suffering. So first of all, you'd have to know that she's ultimately going to make it to heaven. So you'd have to have some reason to believe that, that she wasn't Margaret Sanger or something, right? Um, if you don't know who Margaret Sanger is, go check the internet. <laughs> um, Planned Parenthood, she founded Planned Parenthood. Um, so, assuming that you actually have a reason to believe that the grandma is in purgatory, not actually in hell, then the Catholic Church has a doctrine of something called supererogation. Anybody heard that phrase before that's not on staff? You know what that is? Ah, okay, well, we cover this in our Church History 3 class. Supererogation is the idea that the doctrine that G the saints, and especially Jesus, lived more righteously than they needed to to cover their own salvation. And because they did that, they have created this deposit of virtue and righteousness over here that is above what they need, hence the prefix super. And as it turns out, uh, when Jesus said, whatever you forgive on earth is forgiven in heaven, 
he gave authority to the, the church, and specifically, of course, to Peter, because on this rock I will build my church, and the Roman church claims Peter as the first pope, even though I don't think there's historical evidence that he was ever in Rome, but we'll let that go. Um, and so the pope, or his agents, as he sees fit, can dip into this pool of super abundant virtue to release people from suffering time in purgatory by balancing off what they're, the, the suffering that they're going to go through in purgatory, which is interesting. They can't balance them out of hell. They can only balance them out of purgatory. And so the church has come up with ways of deciding who gets this extra resource applied to them. And if you want to guess, it would be usually, show me the money, Jerry. Um, now, this is a doctrine that still exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's another one, praying for them, doing masses. That's another way that they do that. But there's one, and I have a picture of one on my phone, and because it has the names of the people on it, I'm not going to pass my phone around. And I didn't get the edited copy to the sound booth to display. But they're still doing this. And uh, the people whose house I was in and took a picture of the indulgence on their wall, because they had it there proudly displayed, uh, it's in my neighborhood in Janesville. <laughs> Might even be in the house I bought. <laughs> Might have been in the house I bought. Not anymore. Uh, but yeah, they're still doing this. And historically, uh, it has been more or less emphasized back in the early 1500s. Pope Leo X had a huge building project in Rome. Anybody know what that was? Oh, it's not a chapel. St. <laughs> <Saint> Peter's. <laughs> it's ginormous construction. St. Peter's, and they figured out that we can raise some cash money by having um, indulgences sold. And so they released the monks, to go ahead and do a fundraiser. And they didn't do no walkathon. They, they, weren't, they weren't doing car washes. They were selling indulgences. And right around that time, there was this monk by the name of Martin Luther who had just gotten a revelation that the just will live by faith, the righteous will live by faith. And they, there was quite a debate between him and the first sales weasel documented to man, uh, a monk by the name of Tetzel, who would make up little jingles like his, uh, it works better in the German, so bald das Geld im Koffer klingt, die Seele ins Himmel springt, which is as soon as the money rings in the coffer, your soul will spring to heaven, the soul's released from purgatory, spring to heaven. And he's selling indulgences, and so this actually became the fuel for Martin Luther's famous 95 theses, on the church door, which were all against this whole practice of selling indulgences. They weren't just kind of random, I, I think the Pope's hat is too big kind of thing. And why don't I get one? <laughs> so yeah, and uh, you know, there are modern day Catholics that are, are a little touchy when you raise that subject. Not all of them. Enough. For, they don't believe you. That's the first answer. That's not true. It's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty true. But how does this all fit together? Um, well, you had it part of the culture for so long 
the idea that there is a purgatory. Um, I actually use the phrase now. I used to talk about being in hardware hell when my computers didn't work. But now I talk about I'm in hardware purgatory because at least there's hope for escape. <laughs> <laughs> it might be thousands of years, but eventually I'll get out. Whereas if you go to hell, you're done. Um, was it Steve Miller, big old jet liner? Things you you got to go to hell before you get to heaven. See, I think he got it wrong. I think he really meant purgatory. But then he's he's a rock and roll musician, not a theology guy, so I'll let it go. Um, so where does it all fit? Let's let's just kind of think about this. We had the creation we covered. We started with that. Then we have rebellion, Adam and Eve. They sin. They fall. Uh, God comes, puts them out of the garden, clothes them with animal skins, gives them a promise that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed, will crush the, the, the head of the serpent, and the, he'll strike his heel, right? Which is the first statement, big picture symbolism of the gospel. So right away, he, God's setting out a redemptive path. Um, we go through. The flood, because every thought in a man's heart is wicked from his birth. And God says, I'm really sorry I made these people. And he wipes them out, and he restarts with Noah and his three sons, and they're all, their wives, and they all have families. And, and then eventually we pull out Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then Egypt, and, they, and then they pull Moses out, and we, we try again. We try the first church in the Bible, Moses' church, the assembly of Moses in the wilderness. And those people are a problem. You know, what was it just a couple of weeks ago? Just some stuff is coming out. Christians not acting like Christians. Jake sends me messages. I wish, I wish just Christians would just act like Christians. And then, did you send me Mr. Incredible sometimes? I wish the world would just stay saved, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I agree. And then, but there, there's this 40 year refinement in the wilderness, and finally, Joshua. T- I'm talking fast, so I got to think, Joshua. I don't want to say like Aaron took him into the world. Joshua took him into the promised land across the Jordan. Joshua won. And even then, even after 40 years, he had Achan right away. They couldn't even get like one thing. And then, okay, we got that straightened out. And then it's really cool because it it says Israel served the days, served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who served with Joshua. And yes, there were individual failings, most definitely. But that's quite a testimony to say Joshua did it that well, that the people... He and the people he trained, they all stayed faithful. And then, you know, then not so much. Then you'd have this bouncing cycle of rebellion and judgment and people cry out and God raises up a deliverer and then they have some time where they serve God and then the deliverer passes on and rebellion and <laughs> Judgment and, and this goes on. I think there's like seven cycles of this in the book of Judges. And it just is like every other generation just rebels. And eventually they rebel, they want a king, they bring a king in, you have this whole thing, and this whole thing of God's trying. He, he given the law through Moses, and this is the first attempt and at the first covenant. And eventually, you all know how the, the story ends. He goes, through, through prophecy, he says, your house is left to you desolate. But he leaves a promise of a new thing coming. Behold, the virgin will conceive all of that, which prophesies Jesus in a whole new covenant. Um, in that 
time in the Old Testament, and we're gonna, like I said, we're talking about odd things this morning, there is another one of those cool Bible words that nobody really knows what it means, and that's Sheol. You ever read about Sheol? Yeah. When you read Sheol, what, what word do you put in there in your head? Hell. It's not. It's not hell. Okay? Other than hell, does so anybody else put a different word in there? Grave. Yeah, but you're a pastor. <laughs> so Sheol is it's the place in the dead. Michael, if I screw this up, you correct me, okay? Okay, but I'm, I'm just saying, if I do, I'm, I'm totally open to, to getting it right, because I'm, I'm after right, not being, not being the source of truth, right? <laughs> so, and, and my understanding of it is, is that, you know, David's, when David's son died, he's like, I'll go to him, he won't come back to me. David was talking about, he's going to go into the grave. Everybody will eventually hit that place, the grave. And... That isn't heaven, it's not hell, it's the place of the dead. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus tells a parable about a man named Lazarus who has died, and a rich man who tormented Lazarus when he was alive. And Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. And he was, seemed to be okay, and the other man, and sorry I didn't get the scriptures up there for you guys, um, he is in torment. And he cries out to God and says, could you please send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and bring me something to cool my tongue? And the answer is, nope. You have received your judgment. Well, could you resurrect Lazarus and send him to my brothers so they don't wind up burning here with me? And the answer is quite an indictment, which was... Even if somebody were to be raised from the dead and go to them, they still wouldn't listen. That's, that's quite a smack there. But, okay, so this is before Jesus has been raised, before he's died, obviously, so it's before he's been, before he's been raised. And it seems like there is a distinction made between Abraham's bosom or paradise and the place of the unrighteous. And that, that's my understanding, is that Sheol. Sheol actually had a couple of parts, like Hades in the Greek mythology. And that, that's the closest I can come to finding something purgatory-esque in the scriptures. However, um, I think Jesus changed all of that when he descended to the grave and it was said that he preached to the spirits in prison. Uh, and this is something I heard Ern Baxter teach many years ago and it really kind of changed my thinking about this, that he said to the spirits in prison, on the one hand, you are rightly condemned because you have rejected the truth and to the others, he, he says, I'm going to take those keys from you, Satan, those who, from the one who had the power of death, and he's going to take those, and he opens up the other side, and he leads captivity captive. And he brings these prisoners who've been awaiting his promised coming and redemption David, Abraham, all the Old Testament saints, everyone who's believed prior to the gospel being manifested through Jesus. And he brings them up. And, and, and as he brings them up, uh, the Bible says there's like, what, hun hundreds are seen of, of the saints are resurrected and seen in Jerusalem. Well, we haven't seen that since because there's, there's no need for that. Okay. So here's my final thoughts. 
Hebrews 9, 27, 28. This was referenced earlier. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Here's the thing. Jesus was sacrificed once. He is not re-sacrificed every time we do the Mass. He's not. The Bible says he was sacrificed once. His sacrifice was sufficient to cleanse you from sin, or it wasn't. If it wasn't sufficient to cleanse you from sin, you have no hope. If it was sufficient from sin to cleanse you from sin, it's sufficient. It's enough. So either it was enough or it was not enough. And if either way, you don't need a purgatory. Because you'll either be hell, in which case even the Catholic doctrine says purgatory can't help you, or it's enough. Once for all, cleanse from sin. So, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. All right. So Paul's talking about his body because just in context, just like Jesus did when he said, if you destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. He wasn't talking about a physical building. Paul, if we know our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, if so be that being clothed, we shall be not be found naked, or we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Wow, what version did I put in my notes? <laughs> that seems very not clear English. Um, is that the NIV? Have you got the NIV up there? Yeah. All right, where am I at? Let me back that up to the start. I'll just read what's up there. There we go. For we know if that earthly tent we live in live is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Thank you so much. I don't know what version I got in here. <laughs> go to the next slide. Me, oh, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Is that it? No, that should be more. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm on verse 6. She's got lots of ink underlining stuff in here. So. <laughs> Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. And this was the money verses of this, so that's why I need them. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. So Paul's setting that up, and he's saying, if, if I'm living here on earth in my body, here I am, away from the Lord. But if I die, I'll be present with God in my new home, in my new tabernacle or new body. So 
absent from this body, I'm present with the Lord. Where's purgatory? Because it doesn't seem like, well, I guess you could say, well, well, obviously Paul's a saint. He had, he was put an extra virtue in, so he'd get to go straight to heaven. Yeah. But that's called begging the question, because you've assumed the answer, and now you're interpreting the, the facts to suit the answer you've already decided on. That is not implied in the text. It's not implied anywhere. And he's talking not just about himself. He's making a general statement. This is how it is for all of us. Right? So again, I don't see purgatory. I'm, I'm willing to. Look, really, I am. I want to find the truth, but I just don't see it in here. I see, in fact, the opposite, that it's, it's a binary choice. You is, you're a saint or you ain't. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Away from the Lord, present in the body. I don't, there's no other choice. So, we all, how this works out for us as individuals is at some point in our lives, we are confronted with the truth and we realize, hey, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. I have rebelled against God. I have failed to, to meet his righteous commands. And if he were going to judge me strictly based on that, the reality is I suck. I fail. I deserve hell. That's what I deserve. The wages of sin is death. But thank God for his gift that Jesus came and laid his life down for me. And then we say what? Okay. I receive it. It's all, all it's going to cost me is everything. But instead of hell, I get heaven. Instead of torment, I get peace. Instead of confusion, I get clarity. Instead of meandering and wandering and, and wondering what's going on, I get to have purpose in my life. So really, all the stuff, this is a pulse, everything I counted as gain, I count as loss. Those, those things are worthless. And I, I just chuck them aside for the past surpassing goodness of knowing God. And that's what it is. And then uh, it, it's interesting. We were, we were talking in our men's group on Friday. Boy, we had a lot of great stuff. Jake and I got in a fight. It was awesome. We had a lot of great stuff. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we, we were mad. But we didn't end mad. And so all the guys who were there got to go, Wow, you guys like got mad at each other, and now you're not. You just worked through that. How did, how does that work? <laughs> like, well, that's how it works. <laughs> you know, you, that's reality. Sometimes you just it happens, but we get through it, and we go on. We go on from that. And uh, well, one of the things we got into there is, is we're going through this book by John Bevere called Killing Kryptonite, and he's saying, look, we're, we're trying to adultery-proof our relationship with God, right? And, and here, what do you do to do that? And he's going through, you got to, what was the list? Re, you got to be in the word, you got to pray, you got to have fellowship, and he's, we've got all of these, these things, and I thought, you know, those are all great things. Um, those should be the fruit of your relationship with God, not how you get to a relationship with God. It's cart before the horse. So you can say, okay, you're not doing this. Then I question whether you have a relationship with God. If you are doing them, I'm going to ask you why. Who are you trying to impress, right? Are you trying to impress me? Are you trying to impress Jake? Or are you trying to impress God? And the reason I ask that is because, yeah, I did all of those things. You know, I, I want to be a radical, man. So you have to read your Bible an hour a day. You've got to pray an hour a day. You've got to pray in tongues for, depending on who, whether you were radical or super radical, it was 30 minutes or an hour a day. <laughs> there was this pastor out in, out in the West Coast, Phil Bonasso. He's like, man, if you haven't read your Bible for an hour every day, don't even bother to come ask me anything. 
because you aren't doing the basics. And so you can get into all this stuff. Now, all those things are great. Um, but I don't spend time with my wife to impress her by going, check the little box. I took you on a walk. Actually, I joke about that with her because that's her thing, is going for walks. But we don't spend time together as the goal in and of itself. We spend time together because we want to. And everything that's out of that is a fruit of it, not the goal of it itself. You see, you see the difference there? And so when we talk about our relationship with God, um, that's where we come into. Not that we now have to exchange one set of rules for another, but now we have a relationship with God that's going to cause us, because of our heart position and condition, being completely different. It's going to affect how we live, not because of a set of new set of rules, but because of a whole new motivation. And honestly, I don't see purgatory in any of it. Did that help? You asked one of those questions. Was that a good answer for you? Yeah, I wanted to be able to counter the question with conversation. Yeah. So yeah, it was good. I'm, I'm sure you're smart. Your family's smart. I'm sure you can get into lots of intellectual arguments. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I encourage you not to stay there. Move on to the motivation and fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I think your family's all going to hell or anything. They seem pretty good to me, but um, okay. Some of them might be good, <laughs> but they'll get out. Um, anybody else questions? All right. Any other short ones you want me to hit, Jake? It's about quarter. Oh, I thought short people. Not short people, short <laughs> questions. Uh, Kevin, you short questions. That's probably good. Okay. Um, Thanks, guys. It was, it was fun. Um, let me just quick pray, and we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. Lord, thank you that your sacrifice was once for all time, that your blood is sufficient to cleanse from all sin, to purify our consciences from sin, not just click a legal box. God, I pray this morning that we would be even more stirred up to know you, to carry out your kingdom, to see your kingdom come and your will be done here, and that everything we do, everything, the words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart, it would be pleasing to you, Lord. Amen.